exactly. and wonderful. This is a very, very exciting moment, of course. It's always this on Skep when we have our guest lecturer, but this is special. Um, it was what we call a no-brainer, a no-brainer, to invite Professor David Crystal OBE to come here and be our centenary. Have I told you yet it's the centenary? Yes. Our centenary guest lecturer. Um, and it's a very, very great honor that he accepted. Um, in bookshops, if you go to the linguistics section, uh, I've only ever seen two authors who got a special section of the bookshop to themselves. One is a chap called Chomsky, and the other one, of course, is David Crystal. Um, David's academic career has mainly been focused, I think, on universities in Reading, in Bangor, in Wales, but it began here. Am I correct? You're right. Yeah, I'm right. It began here. David was an undergraduate here at UCL, as I was. Um, I can remember being a schoolboy applying to get into UCL to be a student here, and uh, I thought I'd better prepare, so I bought a Pelican book called Linguistics, and it was by David Crystal. And they accepted me, I managed to scrape in. So, um, this is the first opportunity I've had to thank you, David, for getting me into UCL. <laughs> um, of course, that Pelican book is just one tiny drop in a vast ocean. Uh, am I right? You've written over a hundred books? Oh, sort of. About a hundred. A hundred-ish. hundred-ish. I mean, not a hundred. How disappointing. Oh. 120. 120. My goodness. Um, so just an enormous well, output. There's nothing else to do, Jeff. Really? <laughs> Well, do you mind giving us a talk instead of writing a book? Oh, you could probably write a book in the time it will take you to give this talk. Um, and in fact, the latest, just this year, we have the paperback edition of Sounds Appealing. Sounds Appealing, the passionate story of English pronunciation. Uh, wonderful, wonderful new book about phonetics, and I know that you all want to read it if you haven't yet, because on Skep we are passionate about English pronunciation. So rather than go on and on and on about David's achievements, I think we should listen to what he has to say about paralinguistics, and I'm sure you will join me in giving a very, very passionate skept welcome to the one and the only David Crystal. Paralinguistics is the name of the talk. Once upon a time, back in the 1960s, linguistics decided to become much wider than anybody had thought before. Now I say linguistics, not many linguists thought like this. Certainly not the other gentleman that was referred to. What was his name again? Chum, Chum. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> Uh, no, certainly not him. But there was a mood around. Linguistics was broadening in all sorts of directions, wasn't it? Sociolinguistics was on the horizon. Psycholinguistics was on the horizon. Pragmatics was on a very distant horizon. And one of the horizons that was being introduced to us was brought in by an American professor called Tom Sebeok, S-E-B-E-O-K. And he became an enthusiast during the 60s for a subject that he called semiotics. Now, semiotics, of course, was a term that had been around for quite a while in other connections, in philosophy, for instance, in literary criticism, but never in linguistics before. Now, what was semiotics in Sebiok's interpretation of the term? It was the study of patterned communication in all its modes. Patterned human communication to begin with in all its modes. All its modes? Well, how many modes are there? There are five, aren't there? Five modes of communication because there are five senses. Sound, vision, touch, smell, and taste. So the concept was we study all of these and see which of them are relevant for communication. For human communication, 
Of course, it's the first three. Normally, when we're talking to each other, I, or communicating with each other, I can use sound, obviously. I can use vision through facial expressions and bodily gestures. And I can use touch, as when I shake your hand or clap you on the shoulder or whatever. And touch also means distance as well. And terminology developed to express these different things. In, in the sound area, we had speech sciences, as we know. For the visual side of communication, it was called kinesics, K-I-N, kinesics, as in cinema, cinema, yeah? same sort of root. And for the study of distance and touch, it was called proxemics, the emic ending coming in there, which is a bit cheeky, really, because nobody ever thought that the kinds of semantic contrast expressed by facial expressions and gestures and touching was going to be emic in the same way as traditional phonology was suggesting it might be. So semiotics arrived, study of human pattern communication, and then people thought, well, hang on a minute, animals communicate as well. And so the subject broadened even further and became the subject of zoosemiotics. That's spelled Z-O-O, -O, which people then thought meant zoo semiotics, but it didn't because zoo meant life, and there was a diaresis opposite on top of the first O to try and emphasize that. And that's when people started studying animal communication. And Sebioc edited a huge book of different kinds of animal communication, you know, how birds sing and dogs bark and, and all the rest of it. Now, I was brought up in the straightforward phonetics tradition that you guys all know very well. But I was uh, also very influenced by the trend that was taking place to try and make sure that the phonetics that we were studying applied to every aspect of the human condition, not just, as it were, people speaking rather carefully on formal occasions. And this was because I was a member of the Survey of English Usage that Randolph Quirk was uh, developing in 1960. I was there in 1962 to 63. And my job, because I had been trained in phonetics, uh, the read, read in those days, to have an English department graduate trained in phonetics, but yes, there, 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 there was me. I, I chose the special subject that is in the English department and went over to the phonetics department here and week after week after week and got my training in phonetics from uh, Gimson and O'Connor in a class of three. Can you imagine it? It was me and John Wells and uh, uh, Eleanor Higginbottom, who I don't think stayed in the business. Um, and I became a phonetician. It's the only thing I've been trained in ever, actually, was phonetics unless you count English as, as a training for something or other, I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> Never trained in linguistics, you see. I mean, I had to learn my linguistics by teaching it. That little penguin book that you mentioned, Jeff, um, was written because I had been asked to teach linguistics at the University of Bangor, and I said, where is the introductory textbook? And they said, there isn't one. Uh, and so you end up writing one, don't you? I mean, you've got to do something to try and help you teach the flaming course. So anyway, there was this uh, emphasis in the survey of English usage, which was to try and make sure that the, the phonetic tradition, the phonological tradition really, of course, as well as the grammatical tradition, could apply to all the varieties of English that were around. And Quirk, remember, was looking at, for the first time really, at spoken English in grammar. So the recordings that were being made were being made of everyday natural use in every conceivable circumstance, or almost conceivable, as I'll go on to explain in just a moment. So instead of just having some traditional formal lessons in pronunciation, he, he would record everyday conversation of its of a most informal kind, BBC chats, sports commentary, telephone conversation, a bit of everything would go into the survey. A lot of it was surreptitiously recorded something you couldn't do these days. You'd get into serious trouble, I think. But of course, uh, you, you couldn't go into the English department in those days without being recorded. When you walk into Quirk's office, those of us who knew, knew that we were being recorded. But of course, anybody else didn't. We used to play games and, and, and do silly grammatical constructions <laughs> just to put him off. 
<laughs> we, would go, we would go in and say, I haven't been being seen recently. <laughs> and clerk would go, what, 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 what? It's all being recorded, you see, for the survey being used. Uh, well, anyway. Now, in phonetics, we suddenly realised that there were an awful lot of construction of, of phonetic effects turning up in these um, recordings that traditional phonetic inquiry couldn't really handle. Uh, it, it wasn't phonemic in the usual sense. The traditional intonation analysis that I had learned from them and which you guys all know and Jane has just been talking about, that didn't seem to explain everything either. It wasn't just a matter of finding a, a, a small number of tunes or tone groups or tone units or whatever you'd call them and a certain number of tonal contrasts. Yes, they were there, of course. There was an awful lot else going on as well. And so the sem semiotic perspective said, well, no, look, uh, forget the traditional paradigms of inquiry. Be very empirical and just see if you can capture every effect that you encounter. And that included, of course, any uh, gestures that there might be there. Not that the thing was being videoed or anything, but it was quite clear sometimes that there were, there were some non-verbal communication taking place that affected the, uh, the actual um, sound of what was being said. Well, my job was to develop a system which would try and capture all the phonetic effects that weren't in the traditional systems. And to begin with, uh, the distinction was being made between prosody on the one hand and paralanguage on the other. Now, paralanguage was a term that was introduced in the Sebioc tradition. Para language, para, above, as in parachute, or, or beyond, or at the edge of language. It turned out to be the case that an awful lot of the phonetic effects that would be called non-segmental or supra-segmental or whatever you, term you use could be handled reasonably well by the tradition, but there were effects that were not part of the tradition. A distinction had to be made, and this was the distinction we came up with. Prosody referred to the features of a non-segmental kind that are always there. You cannot have a sentence without them. Paralanguage referred to features that are only sometimes there. They turn up from time to time. You can do without them. Now, it's a fuzzy distinction in places, but that was the kind of uh, distinction that we were trying to implement. So under the heading of prosody, for instance, instead of just having, the, I mean, around the core of tone units and tones and the things that you know very well, we would broaden that to include pitch range variations that applied to uh, whole sentences. A higher level of pitch, for example, as when somebody says, now let me have a little think about that. How are you to describe that, you see? Or a parenthesis where somebody says, now I'll tell you, although I think you know all about this. I'll tell you, although I think you know all about this. The pitch drop that is there for the parenthesis. So these broader concepts of pitch contrast were part of the system. But remember that in prosody there are four dimensions. There is pitch, there is loudness, there is speed, and there is rhythm. And pause, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. Pitch, that auditory attribute of auditory sensation in terms of which sound can be ordered on a scale from high to low. Loudness, attribute of auditory sensation, sounds ordered on a scale from loud to soft. So now it's not just stress anymore that we're talking about. We're talking about contrasts like, this is important! How are you going to write that down? We developed musical terminology for it, even though we knew that music was not a precise analogy, but we would call that forte or fortissimo. And then the opposite effect, piano and pianissimo. Yes, this is important. And then with speed, speed variations. We spent quite a lot of time working out what speed norms were for our different speakers. This never was published in any of the material at the time, but you know, what is the norm? If somebody is going to use speed contrastively in order to make an effect, 
what is the norm for that speaker? Now you measure speed variation in terms of the number of syllables per minute, at least that's what most of the researchers do. Not the number of words, remember. Don't count the number of words per minute when you're trying to work out how fast somebody is speaking, because words can be of different lengths. No, number of sit lapels, how many of those? So what is the norm for this lecture this afternoon? How many syllables a minute am I using now? And if you count them up, excluding the pauses, you'll find that I'm talking at the moment at a rate of about 250 syllables a minute, <coughs> which is a bit faster than you might hear on the radio. Good evening. This is the six o'clock news, and this is David Crystal reading it. In London today, the Prime Minister made a decision. In New York, there was a heart attack. And so on. <laughs> this is 200 syllables a minute. 200 syllables a minute, more or less. That's the Radio 4 norm of presenters. You could, if you wanted, speak at 150 syllables a minute. And some people, I suppose, do. But it gets a bit boring after a while, and I wouldn't want to inflict that upon you. On the other hand, going in the other direction, back to 250 now, doesn't it sound so much nicer than 150? 250, yes, you can speed that up if you like. I can go up to 300 syllables a minute. Let me talk for a few seconds at 300 syllables a minute and see how you're getting on. Are you finding this all right? Are you finding things? speaking a little bit too quickly. If you're taking notes, it's going to be rather difficult to speak at 300 a minute. No, 250 syllables a minute is going to be a very comfortable speed for most people. And certainly in a lecture hall where there might be echo and you're trying to reach people and you have to articulate a little bit more clearly than normal, then maybe I would move down towards 200 from time to time. Anyway, you decide your norm. And then you work out what semantic contrasts that might be using that norm. So, allegro, you speed up every now and again. Consciously, I mean, deliberately, you speed up because you're talking about something and, well, why should I speed up? Because I want to get onto the more interesting thing in a moment. That kind of contrast applies to allegro speech. And lento speech in the opposite direction where you slow down to make a very important point. That kind of distinction was part of tempo in our system. And then we had rhythm contrasts, of course. Of course, speech has its normal rhythm, as you know, and any phonetician would have been talking about stress time rhythm in English or syllable time rhythm in your language or whatever it might be. That is the norm. But you can, of course, make your speech more rhythmical than normal or less rhythmical in normal than normal. And I mean for a semantic reason. I really think it's time you went. I really think it's time you went. Tumpty, 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 tum. This is more metrical for me than my normal way of speaking. And it, and it conveys a certain, what, annoyance, irritation, or something of that kind. Or well, you can sort of speak arrhythmically uh, with a with all the things that go with the lack of rhythm, and that will immediately suggest all sorts of uncertainty on the part of the speaker, or maybe something more, who knows. Get back onto your fluid level, David, quickly, because people will get irritated if you do that for too long. So, pitch, loudness, speed, tempo, and rhythm. And then, of course, the pauses that link the different units of speech that express these prosodic areas. Now this was prosody and not unfamiliar to most people because it relied on paradigms of, that people were familiar with. We all know about pitch and about loudness and about speed. It was, it's been part of phonetic tradition for a long time. But the other side, the paralanguage, there were no precedents for it. Indeed, people didn't really know what to make of the term when it was first introduced. Back in the 60s, there was a lot of debate as to what paralanguage actually was. Did it include, some people argued, that it should include facial expressions and gestures and things like that. That was one view, you know. Paralanguage meant everything apart from 
central language, which meant the emic side of language and the grammar and the vocabulary and things like that. Everything, so facial expressions, etc., as well. But within linguistics, linguists weren't used to describing facial expressions and gestures. Indeed, nobody was. It took quite a while before the first dictionaries of gesture and so on came out. This was at a time, by the way, when the first dictionaries of sign language were being produced. Same sort of emphasis, you see, at the time. So that was being left to other people. People like psychologists and clinicians and anthropologists and so on were developing the visual side of communication. So what were the linguists doing, or at least what was this linguist doing at the time? I was part of a fairly small number of phonetically trained linguists, there were half a dozen in the States, and there were a couple in this country, who narrowed the notion of paralanguage to vocal effects. So the question now is what vocal effects turn up in everyday speech that are sporadic and yet semantically contrastive. And when we wrote this up for the survey of English usage in a book called Systems of Prosodic and Paralinguistic Features in English or something, forget the title. Um, then we had a very pretty small range of effects that were included within that um, remit. Two types, really. The first type concentrated on vocal cord effects. So, first one, the obvious one, the one that everybody knows, was whisper. Whisper. That's a paralinguistic feature. Why am I doing it? What's happening? There's something conspiratorial or whatever about whisper, isn't there? Complete absence of vocal cord vibration. Does whisper exist in all languages of the world? I don't know. I've never found a language that doesn't whisper. You might think that it has some sort of survival value, evolutionarily speaking, so therefore all languages will have it. But as you know, nobody should ever say all languages because of the 6,000 or so languages in the world, only about a third of them have ever been given any kind of study. So who knows what's going on? There might well be a language where nobody ever whispers. <laughs> but for English anyway, whisper was there. That was the first effect. And then, concentrating again on the vocal folds, breathy, breathiness, where too much breath is being released for the needs of the articulation. For a semantic reason, remember. Of course, we all get breathy if we've been running, and I come in, and I'm like this, and everything I say has got breathy speech behind it, because I've been running. No, no, I'm talking about a contrast a specific use of breathiness to make a semantic contrast. So you can knock on the door in certain parts of London and a lady will come to the door and she will not say, do come in, she'll say, do come in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I won't. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, there's a lot of sexy voices around that use <laughs> breathiness, isn't there, as part of the uh, particular effect. I had a lovely recording once um, where, uh, let me get it right for you, yes, uh, the recording went like this. Well, no, first of all, the recording didn't go like this. There were two uh, neighbours talking and one was talking to the other and she said, Mrs Brown, she's, she's just come back from a holiday in the Caribbean. She's brown all over. She looks absolutely fantastic. That's what she didn't say. What she did say was this. Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Whatever, has just come back from a holiday in the Caribbean. She's brown all over. There is a contrast between being brown all over and being brown all over. <laughs> <laughs> this is as clear a minimal pair as you possibly imagine, it seems to me. Anyway, that's breathiness uh, for you. Uh, creak, creaky voice, vocal fry, where the vocal cords are going so slowly that you can actually hear them vibrate. The kind of... Uh, 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 you can 
hear the vibration of the vocal cords. Very slow vibration taking place there. That turned out to be semantically contrasted too from time to time. There's a contrast, isn't there, between oh really and oh really. Oh really. You hear it? Yeah? Oh really. Much more disparaging, isn't it, the, the second one? And of course, for some people, it's such a routine thing to disparage somebody uh, that it becomes part of their voice quality. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, there are some very famous um, character stereotypes of civil servants in offices um, who use that kind of thing all the time. Oh, no, Mr. Bond, really? Yeah. Really, Bond? Oh, that kind of thing. And of course, Creek has become rather fashionable amongst uh, some younger people these days, especially girls. You hear it an awful lot amongst um, you know, teenagers and indeed older, older girls. It seems to have developed sometime in the last couple of decades. And I don't quite know where it's going to go next, but it's a creaky voice. Um, so, where are we going? We're going up the throat here and into the mouth now. Uh, What's going on in, in the mouth? Well, not very much, because of course the mouth is being used for most everyday you know, practical purposes, you know, producing vowels and consonants and this sort of thing. But of course you can have some sort of overall effect that you can switch on and switch off by using the, uh, the tongue or the palate, whatever it might be, in a certain type of way. I suppose the obvious one is um, labialization, where you lip round more than you normally would. Oh, did it hurt there? <laughs> did it hurt? Oh, yes, it did hurt. That's really sad. <laughs> there are three types of occasion where you use lip rounding in this way. One is talking to babies. <laughs> oh, you lovely little baby, yes, my darling. Yes, you are gorgeous, yes, you are. Also, talking to, to animals, your pet. Yeah. Oh, come on, pushy, 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 pushy. <laughs> and then talking to your most intimate associates. <laughs> Kissy wishy potty. <laughs> no, no kissy wishy potty. <laughs> so lip rounding, labialization. Very again, notice these are all sporadic things. Nobody would lip round all the time, at least not if you were normal. Um, nobody nobody would creak all the time, though, having said that, I have given you an exception. Nobody would whisper all the time, and so on. So going into the mouth, you'll find some effects there. And then we mustn't affect, mustn't ignore going up into the nose. Um, that's the other area where you can produce now what? Nasalization, isn't it? And so you can nasalize. And nasalization, when it occurs, is often considered to be simply a clinical kind of thing. So, you know, somebody who nasalizes has got some sort of problem. But no, you can turn on nasalization or turn it off if you choose to. Now, who might choose to? Well, um, I remember a, there was a trend in some lecturers in some universities once upon a time who would nasalize when they were making a very important point. <laughs> a very important point. <laughs> and you get this um, back nasalization. Two types of nasalization you see. There's the posterior nasalization of one, 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 and then there's like, then the front nasalization, which is up here in the front, anterior nasalization. We don't use that so much in British English, but in American English it's actually quite common. There's a big distinction between an American who says, you know, oh really, with, with a generally sort of back nasalization, and then he says, oh really? <laughs> and he is a much more anxious American. <laughs> you know, there was a study done of schizophrenics in uh, America a few years ago, well, decades ago now, and it was established that you know schizophrenia has two moods, and when the mood is manic and ang really anxious, uh, front nasalization comes in, and when the schizophrenic is less anxious, back nasalization comes in. So there are, you know, that's a clinical thing, but it doesn't mean that the distinction is there available for us if we want to use it. Not so important for English. We don't use nasalization as a paralinguistic feature very much in English. Much more common in some other languages. I'm thinking now of a language like, uh, uh, like Brazilian Portuguese, because um, I encountered this effect there, and it really threw me when I first encountered it. Mm. 
Yeah, so we were having a summer school on Cork Cabana. That's what has to do <laughs> sometimes. Um, and this was in February, summer, February. Are you with me? Right. Uh, and uh, it was on the beach. It was just before Carnival. And if you know the Brazilian situation, the groups that pr provide Carnival, the school of the Sambas, Samba schools, um, they practice an awful lot and earn some money in advance of the great procession that comes later in the month. And as I was giving a talk um, to uh, a, a group, uh, they said, oh, there's a Samba procession coming, we must all go and see it. So I stopped talking about adjectives in noun phrases and we went off to see this procession. And we never got back to talking about adjectives in noun phrases. <laughs> for reasons that escaped me, but the cachaça was very good. Um, so I'm now going back to my hotel, and I get lost, because if you know that part of Rio, uh, the streets of the beach curves around, you can easily lose your sense of direction very quickly. And so I have to ask the way. Now my Portuguese was pretty basic, but I did know what two things. I knew how a couple of basic sentences, enough to ask the way, and I also knew that you nasalized in Brazilian Portuguese, as in Portuguese generally, lots of nasal vowels. And I'd heard this an awful lot. So I thought, I, you know, I could do this, I'm a politician, do this. So I go up to this guy and say, excuse me, um, can you tell me the way to go to the bar? Because my hotel was on the front seafront, I wasn't quite sure where. But I said it like this, that, that can you tell me to, I've forgotten what that is in Portuguese, that doesn't matter, but the point is I said it, I really thought how nasal is this. Can you, can you tell me the way to go to Burma? <laughs> and the guy goes, Go to Burma? See, go to Burma? Go to Burma? And he shows me to the local brothel. <laughs> Later, I asked my phonetics friends what's going on, and they say that extra nasalization is effectively a paralinguistic feature of Portuguese. If you over nasalize, then it adds a note of <laughs> to the event. And I struggle to think of a parallel in English, and I have got one. So go outside and say to somebody, Can, can you tell me the way to Soho? And they'll show you. But if you say, can you tell me the way to Soho? <laughs> <laughs> then they will send you to a different part of Soho. <laughs> and Soho. <laughs> and that example made me to my next point. Because we couldn't handle that in the original quirk tradition. Soho is a mixture of breathiness and voicing and some sort of extra huskiness. Of sort of strange things going on in there. We didn't have a category for that particular thing. Why not? Because the kinds of recordings we were being made were just not sexy. I mean, we, I mean, we're talking about that kind of thing. You know, this was reputable stuff, and nobody was giving the kinds of, you know, risque jokes and things of that kind. Where so, uh, things of that kind are going to turn up lots and lots. No, we didn't have that kind of thing. So there's a paralinguistic feature we didn't have, you see. Which leads me to the point, how many paralinguistic features are there that aren't in even our system, as it were? We did include another category before I go on to that, and that was the category of spasmodic articulation. By spasmodic articulation, I mean where the pulses of air coming from the lungs are coming out in pulses rather than in a continuous smooth flow. So if somebody laughs while they're speaking, you've got a paralinguistic feature there. <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> that's really good. That's a spasmodic laugh, isn't it? Laugh, giggle. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> that sort of effect. Not ever all languages have those effects, or if they do, they don't all have the same semantic uh, uh, resonance. Some parts of the world, uh, giggling like that connotes embarrassment. I think Japanese, if I remember correctly, 
uh, there's a certain embarrassment which accompanies a giggle. Whereas in English, of course, you know, the giggle is a giggle, although it has various meanings. Laugh, giggle, uh, sobbing and crying. Sometimes you can't tell the difference on a tape between whether somebody is laughing or crying. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> what, <laughs> laughing or crying? <laughs> uh, and sobbing and things like that. And then tremulousness, a kind of sudden effect which just appears in the voice which suggests that somebody is about to break down or, or whatever it might be. There were some sporadic effects there. But since that time, and it's a long time ago, I've been collecting other things that we don't have in the system. I'm wondering how to handle them. And I mention them to you now as a kind of, uh, well, challenge, really, because I still don't know how to handle them. And one of the things I did in this book that Jack was mentioning was illustrate some. And I'll just take a couple of examples from the book. I used to be able to remember these off by heart, but you know, uh, not anymore. Yeah. Introducing music into the speech, into your speech. You suddenly start to sing. Except it's not singing, it's a musical quotation. Hallelujah! How do you do that? How do you handle that? How do you transcribe that? So that you get the effect well. You suddenly put in a musical stave and try to capture it in that way. That would be a bit misleading because it's not like music. People don't speak out of tune in the same way. There are lots of things like this. I've got a huge collection now of, of musical quotations that turn up in everyday conversation. Somebody arrives in somebody's house and the person says, Ah, 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 here he is. Yeah? What's that from? Jaws. Yes, the opening of Jaws. At least that was the effect that the person was trying to convey. Heard that several times. Uh, what have we got? I've heard examples from the Twilight Zone, from Doctor Who, yes, from Dragnet, from The Prisoner. The shower room scene in Psycho, you know, when something really dramatic is about to happen. Somebody will go, mm, 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 mm. in the middle of a conversation this is, you see. Yeah. The alien tone sequence in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Da, 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 da. Always out of tune. <laughs> so that's interesting. How phonetically do we handle an out of tune musical quotation? <laughs> um, the whistle motif from Clint Eastwood films, I've heard that one. Uh, the chase music from Keystone Cops. And to show that this is across the complete board, the opening notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Da -da -da -da. Now, why is somebody doing that? Well, I don't know. I mean, you have to take each case as it comes and try to work out what effect the person was trying to convey. Sometimes it's just a funny noise, just for fun. But it will always be somehow, you know, appropriate to the context. And there are cases where you won't get it. Darling, will you marry me? Da -da -da -da. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, maybe you will. Depends on the relationship, I suppose. So, musical quotations, that's one example, and it won't take you long if you listen to your own everyday informal interchanges with other people uh, to hear that kind of thing going on. It relates rather closely, I suppose, although I'm not going to go into that this afternoon, uh, to somebody who consciously switches an accent in order to make a certain point. You know, so, so they're trying to convey stereotypically a particular accent. There was an Englishman and an Irishman and a Scotsman, let me tell you this joke. And the Irishman says, ah, sure and all, Bigara, uh, what are we going to do this afternoon? Now, no Irishman ever spoke like that. <laughs> Irish people don't say, sure and all, Bigara, right? Uh, and the Welshman says, look you, boyo. Now, no Welshman ever speaks like that either. You know, we don't say, look you, boyo, but people think they do. <laughs> and so the stereotype becomes the reality. And at that point, Phonetically, you've got to work out how we're going to handle this. You know, there has to be a whole system somehow to capture it. And I don't know how to do that. I you know, haven't been done, I don't know how to do it. And then the one that uh, intrigued me most when I was writing this book 
which slowly built up over the years. To begin with, I, I did, ignored it because I thought it was really trivial. And now I've found so many situations in which it turns up that I'm beginning to wonder whether it isn't actually a possible PhD here. You know, this is what, this is speaking with your mouth full. <laughs> oh, phonetically, how do you handle it? So you're having a meal, and somebody asks you a question, and you really want to get what you've got, showing yourself, yeah, that's a very important point you made just now. And you're speaking with your mouth full. Well, all right, it happened. We never got that in the survey of English usage. We never recorded anybody speaking at a dinner anywhere. So, you know, we didn't have that. But you know when it happens. And so how do you write it down? And you think, well, and I thought, you see, well, it's just during meals. No, it isn't. Here's a list of the things um, that I've encountered where people speak with their mouths full or half full. While holding a writing implement in your mouth, while you are talking to somebody, your hands are otherwise engaged. So you're saying things like, you know, that's an important point, really, right there. And there's a pen sticking out there. Uh, speaking, or trying to, when the dentist, having just put an implement in your mouth, <laughs> asks you how you are. <laughs> and I've had this innumerable times. You know, why do they do that? <laughs> Are you going on holiday this year, Mr. Crystal? Oh, I'm Caribbean. And he understands, you know, that <laughs> dentists are amazing. They, they are multilingual from that point of view. And then, similarly, uh, after you've had your mouth filled with anaesthetic, um, and you are now trying to talk to your loved one at home, and you're saying, well, really, it didn't hurt very much. No, no, it didn't hurt at all. It, it, it was all right. It, 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 it just, it, it, yeah. Uh, for those of us who are into sewing, uh, you're putting pins in your mouth, are you, while you are sewing? Yes, I've seen that happen often enough. Um, people who smoke uh, have a pipe or a cigarette in their mouths. Now, what? You know, cigarette based speech. This is rather interesting, just here. You know, half of the mouth is being used like that. And so, what's happening to some of the features that uh, you, know, you hear the effects, can't you? Coming out there. Um, and then I hurt my thumb. Oh, I'm really, really sore. Hope you come. No, they want it to be better. <laughs> um, removing something tasty from your mouth, ice cream, for example. Oh, mm, was lovely. That was lovely. That was lovely. Yeah. How do you transcribe that? Uh, those of you who uh, have, might have the occasional false tooth or teeth. Um, of course, relate to that. Uh, what have we got? Uh, children. It happens at an early age, you see. You start looking at little kids. P parents put a dummy into their mouth. That's a pacifier in the other tradition. Uh, they put a dummy in their mouth and, and then they say, What do you want for dinner, darling? Sausages. <laughs> you know, how do you know, transcribe more Sausages. <laughs> uh, and then, yes, a lot of people these days uh, pierce their tongues. What happens then? I don't know. Um, we've never, I've never had the chance to explore a pierced tongue, if you'll forgive the way I put that. Um, <laughs> something interesting might be happening there. For boxers, speaking with a gum shield. You know, you speak with a big gum shield, that they use it, they're like, no, I ain't him, I ain't him, I ain't him really hard, I did. Um, some speaking with something covering the mouth, as with surgeons during operations, you know, what, what uh, is that going to affect their speech? People avoiding smoke or poor climatic conditions, and of course, Darth Vader all the time. Uh, I mean, that poor chap, uh, phonetically, would be an interesting kind of study. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Two or two other things. Um, speaking of a gag in your mouth, as in the movies, I have never been gagged, and we've never recorded anybody who has been gagged. But in the movies, you often see people with a gag in their mouth, and they're still trying to talk. Uh, it happens, and so therefore, it's grist for the politician's bill. And finally, 
speaking while somebody else is in your mouth. <laughs> By that I mean a very passionate kiss. <laughs> while people are still talking to each other. They are saying they love each other, um, and yet they are, uh, their tongues are sort of... Uh, um, I do not know how to transcribe that either. Indeed, I do not know how to record it either. <laughs> My own experience, uh, you know, when, when you're doing that sort of thing, um, then you don't want to be doing phonetic transcription. <laughs> and so it hasn't been done. Well, you know, this is the domain of power language. Whatever happened to power language, it, it, it got lost sight of, really. There was a period when people really did try to make paralinguistic transcriptions and full prosodic transcriptions especially in the early days of sociolinguistics or, or conversation analysis. And you look at some of those transcripts and they are really very, very detailed. You know, with all these vocal effects, or as many of them as could be uh, heard, uh, being transcribed in some way. And then it sort of stopped happening so much. I know some conversation analysts still do try their best. And the reason, I think, is very simple. It's very time-consuming. And you have to be a pretty good phonetician in order to capture all these nuances and get them down well. And the sad fact of the matter is that an awful lot of people who do this kind of work, they're well-trained in grammar and semantics and pragmatics and things like that, but they're not well-trained in phonetics. And so they just can't do it. Or if they can, they don't do it because they haven't got the time to do it. So what I've noticed over the last few decades, really, is, is a lessening in the number of what I would consider to be really good quality, um, fine-grained phonetic transcription of prosodic and paralinguistic features. And I'm not being, you know, critical because I, you know, I've done the same thing myself. Um, when Derek Davy and I did a book years ago called Advanced Conversational English, which we just put up on our website, by the way, with all the uh, recordings there. Um, we thought, I mean, this is basically for people who are learning English as a second language, and therefore we don't want to flood them with huge quantities of phonetic transcriptional detail. So in the end, if you look at the transcripts in that book, or as I say, the online version of it, which is there now, uh, you'll see a pretty familiar kind of tone unit, pause type of transcription. Um, and where are all the paralinguistic effects noted? In the notes, you see, in, after, after. So they're not in the transcription, they're in the notes. We say things like, you know, line 33 is spoken in a certain way, faster than normal, or slower than normal, and we do it that way. It's not entirely satisfactory, but when you're doing applied linguistics, you often have to make shortcuts of that kind. So, um, what happened to power linguistics? Well, that's what happened. Uh, I, ho I hope it, uh, it develops into a stronger presence than it has, but that's for perhaps uh, the 2119 colloquium that you grandchildren will come to once. There we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for telling us about uh, porno linguistics and <laughs> paralinguistics. I'm sorry to have wasted your time with the verbose introduction. I should have just said David Crystal. Ta-da! <laughs> That's another one. Trumpet call. Trumpet call. Uh, David very kindly is willing to take some questions. If you've got questions, stick your hand up and please, uh, can you ask them as loudly as possible? If you have, to have a very, very small voice, you could come and speak into this microphone here we don't have any microphones to pass around so and especially if you've got some other examples from your languages that uh, might give interest to very much. any questions for david yeah mark Hi, david. Hi, mark. Uh, yeah so uh, I, I mean i i teach aspects of paralinguistics and phonetics um and i focus on what as, as you have done on sort of the vocal aspect of, of, para, of paralinguistics. Um, I think what I feel that's changed is that we now think more about the listener 
than before. Mm. And now I have a view that the point of paralinguistics is to have an influence on the listener interested in what is the what is the point of it? What was the impact? What was the value of it at that particular occasion? Yeah, so a really, really good point, Mark. Yes, and in the original book that I did with Randolph, um, we hardly talked about the semantics at all. Uh, just in very, very vague terms. Uh, I mean, there are spectrograms, for example, in the book showing some of the effects. Uh, it's very phonetically orientated. These days, it would be totally different, uh, it seems to me. And the reason is because of the development of the subject that we now know called pragmatics. Um, in fact, if you my next book, which <laughs> is coming out next April, is uh, called Let's Talk. And it's basically on a conversation analysis kind of book, uh, very pragmatically orientated. And it struck me as I was doing this that an example of the kind you just mentioned uh, is, is treated in a totally different way. Uh, so I have a section, for example, on laughing. Now, laughing phonetically, we've already discussed. But the interesting question is, why laugh? And when you, people will say, well, because something's funny. No. Now, that hardly ever is the case when you do a conversation analysis. Um, there must be, I suppose, in the uh, 15 or so extracts that we've got in the How Conversation Works book, uh, the Advanced Conversation English book, there must be about 50 or 60 examples of people laughing while they are conversing with each other. And I think only about once or twice is it to do with a joke. The rest of the time, people are laughing because they, <laughs> they just want the, the conversation to continue smoothly and they're passing the conversation over to somebody else or perhaps they're slightly embarrassed about something or they're being uh, self-critical about something or they're softening the tone of the conversation or whatever it might be. And when you do a, a pragmatic analysis of something like laughter, you'll hear, by the way, there are several examples of this done in the research vein in the Journal of Pragmatics, if you know that particular journal. Um, then you suddenly realise, yes, everything's changed and everything's on the context now uh, and the listener is king. And so so you, you've just got to take that perspective into account. Not easy sometimes. Um, as I say, I wasn't expecting to find so many examples of non-funny laughter in my tapes. They were there all the time, but and I, like you, I've assumed not because people are being funny. No, they weren't. And the same thing, I think, would apply to something like CRISPR. I said, conspiratorial? Yeah, really? Always? Probably not, when you start analysing all the instances where people whisper for some reason. What are those reasons? And that is a very different perspective. Yeah, thank you. In your talk, you mentioned Trump's nasalisation and that nasalisation. I assume that front nasalization is using the front area of the nasal. That's, that's right. Area. Front nasalization, the anterior cavity, uh, as it were, going up into your forehead almost, it feels like. Back nasalization at the back here. Uh, it's the sort of thing where you've got a sore throat, for instance. Yeah. You'll probably have back nasalization from time to time. Uh, front nasalization is really something rather, rather different, rather uh, involves more energy uh, and is much less common. Um, clinically, you get the same thing if you've got a child with a cleft palate, for instance, it's back nasalization you're going to hear almost all the time. Front nasalization does require a special effort. How do you teach it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, uh, when, when I was working in the clinical field and doing phonetics here training and performance with my speech therapy students um, and we were trying to simulate all the range of clinical effects that there were. I mean some of them we just couldn't do of course uh, because we didn't have relevant uh, disordered anatomy. Um, but uh, how, how do you do it? Well, some people just do it by good listening and instinct and everybody, you all have done it after all you see. We've all had a sore throat or something and, and temple kind of cold or something like this and temporarily found ourselves getting back nasal. Uh, I tried to, uh, by imitation, get them to uh, remember that experience. And some can do it, some can't. Um, 
It's like trill, trilling is the fruit of the tongue, you know, some people can do it, some can't. You can sweat blood trying to get somebody to go <coughs> and fail. But you probably will. I, mean, I wonder if they look different, front and back nas nasalization. Oh, not obviously. No. no. That's an acceptance of father. The pragmatics of the situation makes you look different. So in the schizophrenia case, I mean, the anxiety was evident um, non verbally, non vocally. I mean. Thank you. Right, more questions. At the back? Can you shout out? Hi. side of the brain were informational features, very broad features of that kind. Um, so I don't know anybody, but then this is, I just don't know, but there may well be some articles out there on the, neuro the, the, the neurology of some of these phonetic categories. Anybody know? I've, I've not come across them. But then, you know, I've not been studying this side of things for a long time, and uh, life has probably passed me by in that respect. Oh, no, sorry. Other questions for David? Yes, another one at the back. Marina. I was first taught that there was a link between phonetics and gesture by Doc O'Connor, actually, um, who, who used to say to me, uh, you can probably tell, when I was doing ear training, he would say, you can tell whether my voice is going up and down by watching my eyebrows. <laughs> and you know, go, hmm, and hmm, and, and the eyebrows go up. And it's damn difficult to do it the other way around, to do it, hmm, while bringing the eyebrows down. And if you were using gesture to go with it, you know, mm, and mm, it's really difficult to go. Mm. I find it very hard to do. So there's obviously some kind of deep-rooted neurological coordination thing going on there. Um, well, of course, fortunately, thanks to video and iPhones and all the rest, it's possible to start making recordings of this kind now so we can study this kind of thing in more detail. But once again, uh, life has passed me by. I haven't done any of this. I'm sure it is you know, an important next step in the investigation of this kind of thing. And I would expect to find uh, all sorts of correlations. Some will be intuitively obvious, like if you have a screen, there'll be some movements of the head. There may even be a, a finger movement and things like that, you know? Um, the, uh, the comparative context is very important here. There was a dictionary of gesture that came out earlier in the year by a French gentleman, um, which really looked at international, what's his name? I viewed him in The Spectator, I can't remember his name now. He with P though, if that helps. Um, the point is, it was a comparative study of gesture and, and facial expression too. So, what does a facial expression mean in the different cultures of the world? What does a gesture mean in the different cultures of the world? What does this mean in the various cultures of the world? Uh, does it mean hi, or does it mean stop, or what? Uh, there was apparently an event during the uh, war in Iraq uh, where Americans uh, came towards a group of people going like this. And to the Americans, that meant stop where you are. To the people, it meant come closer. And, and there was death as a result of that. 
Uh, that's the kind of thing that this guy has been studying. Polydeck, is it? Oh, I can't remember his name. Silly me. Anyway, the thing is, um, there's a lot of cultural variation here, and uh, that really is going to be well worth well worth studying. Might even be regional dialect variation too. Okay, now sorry, you've just crept in. Yes, one more question. Yeah, I missed the first part, heard the second part. The very beginning was? Um, about the playwright. Did they um, design their own way of encoding the power? Ah, the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, I don't know how much variation there is out there. Um, there is an awful lot of individual variation in the ways that people are approaching this. Um, but. I just get the feeling that the subject has gone off the boil and, and therefore some of the applications in the directions you're, you're thinking of uh, just haven't been explored in that kind of way. I don't know. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed. It's gone four, so I think we should, uh, I think we might get a chance to ask later. Um, I think we should uh, bring things to a conclusion, conclusion there. I think that, um, you may well find that there's a lot more interest in paralinguistics now. People will take their passionate interest in English pronunciation and be passionate about paralinguistics as well. David, I think, will is willing to sign books if anybody has brought books and they want signatures. I think oh, you're sure. willing to do that. I'll sign anything except a cheque. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, please show your passion again with uh, a round of applause. Thank you.